Just last week, I was blessed with the opportunity to share a message in a Kenyan church. There was about 40 or 50 people in the church representing five different tribes in Kenya. So I was trying to think of a message that would be relevant across cultures. And I came up with this. Everybody around the world makes decisions. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. That's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Each and every day, we're faced with hundreds, if not thousands of choices, and we have to make a decision. <laughs> sometimes we make good decisions, sometimes we make bad ones. Sometimes they're big decisions, and sometimes they're little. So a good little decision might be to decide what you had for breakfast, and after you eat it, if you enjoy it, okay, good decision. But it can be a little more complicated than that. Some good decisions <laughs> that, that are weighty, that are super important, are like who you're going to marry. If you're going to have kids or not, uh, if you're going to choose a healthy diet to affect your life, what friends you're going to choose, because your friends are highly influential in your life. There's so many decisions that you make, whether or not to do illegal drugs or whether or not to overindulge in alcohol. You can make good decisions there and lead towards a path of a blessed life. So let's say that it's a V. Blessed life is over there. Cursed life is over there. The more good decisions you make, you go toward the blessed life. The more bad decisions you make, you go towards the cursed life. Some bad decisions you could make are kind of just the opposite. You could choose bad friends. You could choose the wrong husband or the wrong wife. You could choose to overindulge in alcohol and then make that a staple in your life. And that kind of marks you you could choose to do drugs. You could choose to lie, cheat, steal, to deceive others, to betray others. So there's so many different good and bad decisions that we make on a daily basis. And like I said, the more good ones you make, the more you head towards that blessed life. And to the contrary, the more bad decisions you make, you head toward the cursed life. So I was standing up there sharing this message to the Kenyan church, and of course I had an interpreter. I'd say maybe half of them spoke English, broken English. The other half uh, spoke Swahili. So I had an interpreter, and I kind of had to pace my way through it. But I had to verify what decisions they were able to make on a daily basis. It's a different culture than what we have here in America, completely different. So I had to really simplify it. And the majority of the people in church in Kenya are women and children. Not many men attend church. So the majority of the congregation was women and children. So I wanted to make it relevant to the women for true decisions that they had. One thing in the Maasai culture is that the women find where they're going to build a house and the women build the house. Now, it's a boma. It's sticks and mud and straw. It's a boma. It's small, maybe 10 by 10. Uh, but they decide that. They decide where it's going to be, if it's going to be in dirt and dust, or if it's going to be in green leaves and kind of a fruitful area, because their husbands are shepherds. And it's very important that they're shepherds with the goats, the sheep, the cows, that as they roam around, they be able to find uh, green vegetation for them to be able to survive and water. So you have to kind of be near a river or a water source as well. So that's definitely a decision that Maasai women make is where to build the home and then also how to build the home. They could choose to build it weak. You know, you hear about a, a, a house built on sand or a house built on rock or a weak house, or a strong house. You hear stories about that. They have that decision. So as I was sharing this message with them, one of the big decisions in their life is where they're going to build their boma and how they're going to structure their boma to be strong or weak. So with that example and a few others, like their friends, uh, the overindulgence of alcohol or drugs, they understand all of that. Now, they don't, unfortunately, get the choice of who they're going to marry, oftentimes it's an arranged marriage, and they don't get to decide if they're going to have kids because that's the man's decision, or how many kids they're going to have because that's the man's decision. So I, I kind of stayed away from those decisions uh, as I was laying out the examples, and I kept it in their lane so they would understand the weight of the decisions that they make. 
And after I went through a few light decisions or even, you know, kind of the mid-range decisions that they can make and the consequences of good decisions versus bad decisions kind of laid the groundwork for where I was going. I wanted to share a story about a major decision in my life, and I've told it on a couple of other videos on this channel, but I want to share it again. When I grew up, I was in the third grade, my dad, uh, well, it was my dad, my mom, and me, and my brother, and my sister, and we lived in mid-south Georgia. We, that's where we grew up. My dad was a pharmacist. He had a pharmacy, a drugstore right there in the middle of town, right in the town square. So we were kind of the center of attention when we moved to that very small town. Unfortunately, my dad became the target of a lady who was known to kind of be flirtatious and break up marriages. Well, he fell prey to that. Uh, she set him right square in the middle of her target and went after him hard and was going in the store, frequenting, flirting with him, pumping him with admiration and praise and just things that you don't normally get as a dad or a husband of three in a, in a family that you're starting out. Those kind of things fall to the wayside, unfortunately, and you become more of a dad rather than a husband. So he took it hook, line, and sinker, and long story short, he wound up divorcing, well, my parents divorced, my mom divorced him for the infidelity, and then she took me in the third grade, my brother in the sixth grade, and my sister in the seventh grade, and we moved away to a town two hours away where my mom's brother lived. So here we are in a trailer park in a new town, moved right in the middle of the school year. So it was very hard on us as kids. And I'm in the third grade, but my mom didn't let that define us. She decided that God was going to be our dad and she completely gave our whole family to God. I remember distinctly me, my brother and sister kneeling down in front of her while she stood up, hands up and prayed over us that the void of not having a dad would be filled with God, that God would step in. He would be the dad. He would be the father of our household and he would not let us fill that void. Of course, for several earthly reasons, we did miss our dad. But yeah, God stepped in, faith prevailed. That's where my faith came from, was God was always there. He was always there with a safety net, with his arms open, his hands out to catch us whenever we were in a low spot. And that has defined my life. But the choice I had is I could have followed my dad's lead when I grew up. I chose a wife. I got married. I had a family. I could have chose to follow my dad's lead. I could have married, I could have had a family, and I could have decided to be unfaithful. I could have decided to be a non-present dad. My dad was pretty much non-existent through my raising. Uh, I didn't see him very often, and when I did, it was very surface, and it was very distant, so I didn't have that. So I had a decision as I was growing up and getting married and starting a family, starting to become that, that adult, I could have followed his lead. I could have said, well, my dad wasn't there, so I'm not going to be there. My dad was unfaithful, so I'm going to be unfaithful. But I had a choice to make. And I made what I believe to be a great decision, not just a good decision. I chose to be a great husband. I chose to be a great dad. I had three daughters. They're grown now. They've got families of their own. We're super close. We get together all the time. And I'm blessed because of what I poured into them. So really, I had the decision to be like my dad or be the opposite of my dad, to be present, to be there, to be with them, to be encouraging. So I really looked at it as what did I want in a dad that I didn't get? And I kind of became that for my girls. So that was a huge life defining decision for me that I believe was a good one. All that being said and all the decisions that I made through my life Clearly, the number one decision, the best decision I've ever made in my life is accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. Hearing the whole story of creation and the gospel and salvation and then being faced with a choice and deciding to follow Christ, clearly the solid foundation, the ground, the, I mean, it is everything. Everything in my life is built off of that peace. 
when I was talking to uh, the Kenyans and I came to that point in what I was sharing, they a lot of them have motorcycles. That's how they get around. Not a lot of them. Some of them who want to get around other than walking have motorcycles, but part of the motorcycle is insurance. They have to buy insurance for that motorcycle because if they wreck it, if they hurt somebody, if they hurt themselves, insurance has to cover that. So I was relating this acceptance of Christ and the solid foundation and the peace and having that in place as the core of your life as motorcycle insurance. Because when they ride their motorcycle, they have the peace of knowing that if anything happens, my insurance is going to cover me. In life, if anything happens, I know God's going to cover me because I am a Christian. I do follow the way. I know that Jesus is the way, the life. <laughs> He's the only way to, to God. And I understand the gospel and I accepted that. So I have life insurance through that, where they have motorcycle insurance, I have life insurance because I know without a shadow of a doubt, no matter what storm comes my way, I've got that insurance of salvation. I know that even all the way, the worst thing ever would be to just go through, lose everything and die. It's going to be okay because there's an afterlife I'm taking care of. I know I'm going to spend eternity with the father. But just like anything, you can't make a decision unless you're faced with choices. So when you're faced with choices to do this, to not do this, to eat this, to not eat this, to be friends with this person, to not be friends with this person. So part of that is being faced with a choice. And to be faced with a choice, you have to have knowledge. You have to have understanding of what happens if I do this and what happens if I do that. So you're going on that trajectory toward a blessed life or a cursed life. So all these hundreds and thousands of decisions that we make each day, you have to be faced with a choice to be able to make a decision. And in order to make the best decision, you have to have information, right? So in order to make the best decision I've ever made in my life, I had to hear the story. That's what I'm going to share with you right now. Now, in its simplest and most compact, abbreviated way, I'm going to share the story. And then you're going to be faced with a decision. So you look at creation. That's how we know that there's a God. You look at the world, the, the globe, the earth. You look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavens. You look at all the life, all the different species of animals, all the species of plants, water life, land life, humans. You start digging in deeper and you look at the perfection of the different species and how they all kind of gravitate towards each other. There's no... Uh, cross mingling of that unless it's you know by human hand crossing species but you see all those light kinds you look at sight how does sight work you look at the digestive system the circular system our neuro system the brain the brain stem our nervous system how that works you look at reproduction you look at God's perfection everything there you look at the sun and the moon even though there are millions of miles difference between the distance from Earth. They're the exact same size in the sky. The moon is exactly where it needs to be, and it marks how we know uh, the calendar, how we know months. You look at the stars in the heaven and the constellations. They mark the seasons of the year, like the zodiac that goes across the sky. That's how we mark our year. You look at the revolution of Earth around the sun, that's how we mark different things. The sun is the warmth. If it were any hotter, we would all die. If it were any colder, we would all die. It's perfect. So when you look at a painting, you kind of ask yourself, who painted that? When you look at a building, you ask, who built that? If you were walking along the shoreline on a beach and you came across this fantastic sandcastle with stairs, doorways, uh, the roof, everything in place just right there. If you looked at that, you would never ask yourself, how long did it take the wind and the waters to create this thing? You would ask, I wonder who made that? I wonder who built that? The same thing to an infinite level is creation. You have to ask who created that. When you look at the perfection and complexity of everything in creation, you have to ask yourself, who created that? And then you wonder, okay, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he show himself? Well, he does. He does through his word. 
And if he were right there with us, like he was with Adam and Eve, that's the original beginning. Adam and Eve were the first man and woman created. He was right there with them. And the idea was for him to dwell among us and, and us to be with him. But he's so holy, he can't be around sin. Rather, sin can't be around him because it would just light up in flames. So we know that Adam and Eve fell. He told them one rule, don't eat from the tree of good and evil, because then your eyes will be open and you will know right from wrong and you will surely die because you will have sinned. And the consequences of sin is death. Blood has to be shed. That's God's rule. He created everything. If there is sin, there has to be blood shed, death. So God's word, what he left us with, is right there with the whole story of everything. He reveals himself through his word and through creation. So Adam and Eve learned about sacrifices. They learned that if they wanted to be with God, if they wanted to pray to God, if they wanted God's favor, if they wanted to cleanse themselves from the sins that they were creating, something needed to die. Something needed to be given up. So whether it be their first fruits from their garden their best fruits, or an unblemished lamb, where it's that perfect lamb or perfect cow, they would need to sacrifice that. So they would pray their sins on that animal or on that harvest, and they would sacrifice it to God because something needed to die in order to be able to gain that relationship. So all through the years, through the Old Testament, People were sacrificing animals to be with God, to be forgiven of their sins. But through the Old Testament, God kept giving us clues. He would give us exactly where the Messiah was going to be born, when he was going to be born, who was going to be king when he was born, all the details of his birth. So we would be without question of when he sent his Messiah to be the ultimate sacrifice, to be the ultimate perfect lamb for us so we didn't have to pray on to animals you wonder why that quit <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore because jesus came he's the messiah and he lived a perfect life a blameless life he fulfilled the law the law in the old testament was given to us to say god was saying hey here's the standard if you want to be in my presence if you want to have my favor if you want to be with me and commune with me Here's the law. This is the Old Testament. These are the 10 things that you have to do. Well, guess what? Nobody can do those. It was really a mirror, God holding up and saying, here's what I need, but here's you. You can't be that. So something has to happen. That's where the sacrifice came from. We always fall short. All men fall short of the glory of God. None of us, no, none of us can live that perfect life until the Messiah came. He fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. You can look it up. You can do your own studies. Jesus is the Son of God, and everything happened the way it was supposed to. Well, he fulfilled the law. He was raised up. He lived 30 years before he started his ministry, and he was living that perfect life. So he was the perfect lamb. Then he started his ministry for three years, and he walked among the people. He got his 12 disciples. All the stories are right there in the Bible, what he did and how he lived and how he revealed himself and how he claimed to be the Son of God. Of course, the people of that time didn't like it. It was blasphemous. It went against everything they thought, and they wound up killing him on the cross. Well, there's the sacrifice. But that's not the end of the story. Three days later, as we know, three days later, two women go to the grave... And the grave is empty. The tombs rolled, the, the stone is rolled away. The doors open and they look and Jesus is gone. So two women, which was very relevant to the Kenyan church that I was speaking to because it's women and they don't get a lot of accolades. They're kind of the, the lower in society. But to remind them that God chose two women to find the empty tomb to be able to share the news of Christ's resurrection was pretty cool to them. So they all smiled and lit up when I reminded them of that. But those two women went and told the disciples. The word started spreading. Then here comes Jesus. He reveals himself to them, lives among them for 40 days. He's right there among the people. Everybody's seeing him that just saw him die on the cross. Now they're seeing him again, walk again with his pierced hands. You could touch it in his side where he got stabbed with the spear on the, on the cross. He was revealing all of that. This is who I am. And then with so many eyes watching, he, after the 40 days, ascended into heaven to be with God. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. So he was going to prepare heaven. 
But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son to live a perfect life, to live a sinless life, to be the sacrifice on our behalf, to take every sin of every person, past, present, future, on Him. Take all of that, just like the lamb did and the sheep did or the cow did in the sacrifices. Jesus took every bit of that from the whole world, from the beginning of time to the end of future, on him. And it died with him. And when he rose again, he defeated sin and death. And that's grace. It was a gift. It was a gift to us from God. God sent his son because he loved us so much to be that sacrifice for us so we could once again be the Adam and Eve in the garden with that perfect relationship with God. But it's not that simple. What do we have to do? We have to believe. John 3.16 and many other verses say, if you believe, then this. If you don't, then you should perish. Well, perish is the separation from God. So you can either die and live in eternity with God, or you can die and live in eternity apart from God, and you will perish. It's your decision. So going back to the original, what I'm talking about, good decisions and bad decisions, yeah, there's small little decisions that you make every day, hundreds, thousands. There's a little bit medium decisions that you make, well, even, you know, important decisions where you're choosing your friends, you're choosing whether to do good things or bad things with alcohol or drugs or overindulgence, who you're going to marry, where you're going to work. I mean, all these decisions in your life, but the single greatest decision of your life is whether to choose and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He's a gift from God, and He came to be the perfect sacrifice for you. Once you accept that and you believe that and you say the prayer of, I repent of my sins, I confess I'm a sinner. You can do that right now. I'm a sinner. I confess I have fallen short. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe He's the only way. He came and told us, I am the way, the life, and the truth. I'm the only way. No man comes to the Father unless through me. If there was another way to get to heaven, do you think Jesus would have died on the cross? Because if he's the son of God and he's got that power, you think, oh, that's just one way, but there's other ways. Why would Jesus decide to do that? Why would he give up and and be willing? And of course, it was a struggle. He prayed and bled. He sweated blood because it was so stressful. And he asked that God take it away from him, but he did it. He was obedient all the way to the cross and all the way to the grave. If there was another way, he would have bowed out. He would have, right when he was praying in the garden, when he asked God to take the cup away from him, if God said, ah, no, you need to do this, but I'm going to provide other ways for people to, to get to heaven and be forgiven. Jesus, at that moment, would have said, there's other ways? Then I, I won't do this. Now, you can do your own studies and you can learn what, how, how you know all this to be true, especially with the records of the 12 disciples and what happened after Jesus came back and he ascended into heaven, how each one of them died. Not one of them defaulted and said, I didn't know him. He wasn't the son of God. I didn't do that. Each one of them died a gruesome death, I think, except John. Uh, but they died gruesome deaths. They were martyrs. They believed it to the end. There's no way that would have happened. Plus all the witnesses that saw him when he came back. You do your own studies and you learn how you know that the Bible is true. Now, why do you think Christian Christianity is the most mocked religion there is? Why do you think it's the butt of all the jokes? Why do you think people say GD? Why don't they say Buddha? <laughs> Why don't they say Allah? Why don't they say whatever the other gods that are out there? Because Christianity is the real deal, and it's the biggest threat, and it's the biggest truth there is. That's why people are so scared of it. That's why people mock it. That's why it is the center. It is the central religion for controversy around the world. Because evil knows that its time is limited. 
Now, I tell you that story to face you with a decision. Now that you've heard that story, you heard creation, you heard how it happened, you heard the fall of man, you heard Jesus' promise, you heard what happens when you sin, blood has to be shed, sacrifices. He came, he lived a perfect life, died on the cross, resurrected, and salvation was granted by grace, by God's love to you. Now you are faced with a decision. There's no excuse. You can't say, well, I didn't know. Now you know. So if you want to make the single most best decision, greatest decision you'll ever make in your life, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Get into a good church. Now, there are sucky churches out there. There are dangerous churches out there. Find a true Bible-believing, good, grace-filled, loving, accepting church. Go there and understand the truth of God's Word and start growing in Christ. Here's to making good decisions. See you next time. Hey!